Hey guys, you may recall this device from a recent unboxing video in which I was stymied by a lack of documentation. What it is, is an RCA WT509 CRT tester I picked up off eBay and alas it did not come with a manual. I uh, did a quick recap and guessed at how the functions should work. But there were a number of calibration controls inside that I had no idea what to do with. And uh, again, I was guessing at the functionality. Well, thanks to a tip I received on the video camera forums, I have a manual. I got this from an outfit called Manuals Plus. I'll include a link in the description. So, this has not only a description of all the controls, in testing procedures, we also have a schematic and calibration procedure. Oh, also a, a circuit description. In other words, theory of operation. And under the maintenance here, we have calibration instructions. So, in this video, I propose to go through and see if we get this thing working the way it is supposed to. Now I'm still lacking the setup chart, but uh, essentially all I work with uh, uh, to date are round black and white picture tubes and a few rectangular, but they all have the same base, the same pinout, the same voltages, with a few exceptions like the uh, predict the CRTs. Otherwise all 6.3 volt filaments and uh, same uh, pin arrangement, the uh, Duo Decal 12 pin socket. Uh, in other words, uh, I've got the adapter here somewhere. This guy. I also notice they've included this, which I assume is their universal adapter. So it would be nice to get the tested data at some point and figure out how to use all these. These look like the small type you'd use in a predicted type CRT. At any rate, let us proceed to go through the procedures. So, as before, I'm going to uh, take this chassis out by undoing uh, some Phillips screws on the bottom and on the side here. And we, uh... oh, uh, something else I got is, uh, when I recapped this before, I didn't quite have the right components when I made uh, some uh, quick uh, substitutions while I also ordered up the correct components, so we'll be able to... Uh, install those. I noticed while I took these screws out that some are a bit corroded, so I think I'll throw them in a cup of Evapo rust while I work underneath. Put a towel down so I don't scratch anything up, especially the meter face. And here we go. So here's the new caps I put in. This one I'm fine with. 4 microfarad, 600 volts, that's what the original was. But these guys were originally 2 microfarad at 400 volts. Didn't have any handy, so I took a couple 4.7s and put them in series to double the voltage rate and cut the capacitance in half. Well, I since picked up these guys from those are electronics. Well, the original were electrolytics, but these are plastic film, which will work just fine. 2.2 microfarad, 400 volts. So. Put these leads over, pop those guys in. And I also noticed last time that pretty much all of these uh, resistors are out of spec, so I think I'll go ahead and replace a bunch of those as well. I can find my quarter inch nut driver. Those are in here somewhere. And we'll take off that circuit board. Without question, one of the most useful tools in my toolbox, yet I'm constantly misplacing it.
Now before we dive into that board, here's a little tip for you, especially in the colder weather. Microwave your evapo rust for a few seconds to get it warmer. This stuff works better at elevated temperatures. Don't get it boiling, but uh, certainly works better warmer than cold. In fact, uh, below a certain temp, I think like 50 degrees or so, it really doesn't work at all. I had to put two in series. That's because the originals were oddball values. 7.5k and uh, 1.2 meg. I just didn't have those on hand. So put a 5.1 and a 2.4k together to make 7.5k and a 1 meg and a 200k to make 1.2 meg. Now I'm gonna make sure I got all the old parts out of here because some of them will fall inside. Oh, and uh, by the way, and notice big size difference. Well, these are actually two watt resistors. They're uh, Viché two watt metal film resistors, so they can handle it. But they uh, probably get a little toasty, so I mounted them up off of the board. And here are the two new film caps I put in. All right, now there are some uh, resistors mounted here and there around in here that I'm going to check and replace as needed and I suspect I will need to replace all of them. Also notice this bulb is kind of loose. That must go through a hole somewhere. Let's see it goes down up in here. Just kind of pull out of that lens while it doesn't work on the board. Oh and there's also a cap down in here. I guess I'll replace that as well while I'm at it. Okay, there actually were only a few resistors at a tolerance, and I replaced that with one cap. The big power resistor is still good. So now, let's see about the procedures. Oh, I also noticed on the schematic here that uh, they used the tap transformer for the filament voltages. So 2.35 and 2.68, those are for the predictor. 21 and 17 inch CRTs and any other standard range uh, voltages. Uh, do so. well, this is good. There's a little uh, simplified test data here. 
I believe this is the basing, so for a tube that uses like 7GR, they say use socket 6, for example. So at least that's something. Alright, maintenance. Power line monitor. Well, I'll just use my trusty DMM. Likewise, VTVM or VOM. I'll just, I'll just use my Fluke 27 for all that stuff, which is a true RMS, which is nice. 250K 1 watt resistor, and I'll see what I can cobble together on a 6.3 ohm 10 watt resistor. Again, I'll see what I can cobble together. I assume the 6.3 ohm has got to be for testing the, uh, the filament voltage under load. 250K, probably for testing the G1, G2 voltages. Yep. So you use a universal socket adapter and hook up the filament leads to the 10 watt resistor. So that's the first thing I got to dig up. Let me see how to set these controls. I'm sure the first thing we want to do is calibrate so that we got 6.3 volts AC under load, which makes sense. All right, well, I will get all that set up. All right, let's give this calibration procedure a shot. Couldn't find a 6.3 ohm 10 watt resistor, but I did find a 6.8 ohm 10 watt resistor and threw an 82 ohm in parallel, which will get me pretty darn close to 6.3, certainly within the plus minus 5% specified. All right, so I went ahead and set up all the controls as indicated for the first procedure. And now I should hook this up to power. I'll first adjust this mechanically so that the meter is just on zero. It's off a little bit. There we go. All right. Now they say to plug this into a line. An RCA WV-128 power line monitor, I will use my Syncor PR-57 after I untangle all these cords. Okay, it's plugged in and turned on. Set tester function, switch to read line function. Alright. Then I'm supposed to adjust R24 so that the meter reading on here on a little line voltage section matches what I'm reading. Now my PR57, I don't quite trust that dial scale to be accurate enough. So I am going to use my true RMS Fluke 27 FM to double check that line voltage. Hmm, it'll be a little bit tricky for all to see. First off, let's find out where R24 is. It's going to be one of these trimmers down in here. Oh, I was hoping they'd be a locator. Oh, okay, they're labeled on here. Oh, I see R24 at a second from the bottom right here. And then I'm going to clip in this guy right to the AC line. Which is easy to get at because I can see it coming in right here. So I go into the fuse. And this I go right here. 
All right, so. I'm going to adjust my PR57 so I get a nice round number, like, let's say, 120. Close enough. Now, I got this thing on its side, so gravity is pulling down on the, on the meter, so I don't quite want to uh, adjust it like that. I said I'm going to disconnect this. Get this out of the way. Flip this back down. Help this back up. Should have done this in the first place. Make sure nothing shorts up because that would be ugly. That's actually not too far off. It's reading just shy of 120. Tweet this a little. Yeah, plenty of range with that control. Yeah, 120. So I guess I got, if nothing else, hey, this makes a nice little. Uh, the AC line voltage monitor. We can go from about 100 to 140 on it. Okay, so step one is completed. Turn tester off. Sure, my voltmeter. Set to 10 volt range, got connect three to the brown and black socket adapter. Yeah, okay, now we're gonna cover that. They don't mention hooking up the load, which I would have thought would be part of this. Oh, okay, that's in the preliminary setup. Actually, I should have that load connected right now. So, let me disconnect all this stuff. So, I've got the universal adapter hooked up to it with these clip leads. And brown and black are filament, apparently. But I said these were labeled, and not just going by color code. But, uh, double check that. Brown and black I should go to my dummy load. I don't think that will affect this calibration, but I will go through it again. So, 120. Well, actually not. Oh, okay, because this is this is turned off. It's in the calibrate position. Got it. All right, now I need to remove these clips from here. So yeah, when when you I keep forgetting when this thing is turned off, it actually does something, which is <laughs> a little disconcerting. So right now this device is turned off, but the, there's still power going through the meter, so it is kind of on. So there's no power coming out to this test socket adapter. There's no voltage going to this dummy load. There's no power being applied to your device under test. But it is monitoring the line voltage when it's turned off. Now I'm going to turn it on. And this should be around 6.3. That is well below that. Now this should be getting a bit toasty. Yeah. Alright, turn calibrate clockwise until we get 6.3. Right. Going up as it should. Not exactly 6.3, excellent. 
and we adjust R23 so that this meter is on the calibrate position. Oh, and I should have had this on calibrate while I was doing that. Dummy, dummy. Yeah, see, when you turn this, the meter moves, and it's supposed to be right on calibrate when everything is good. So, let's get this back to 6.3. Being off a hundredth of a volt is not going to matter one way or the other. And this should be on the black cal mark, so off a little bit. A little bit. Look, amazing. There's a calibrate with a little A, and then there's a red line, I think a black line, and a green line. And I guess those those correspond over here because there's a little green bar and a red bar and a black line. I'll zoom in on that on this AC portion here. So I guess the idea is when you calibrate it, uh, in the field you're not they don't expect you to have an AC voltmeter with you, and you don't know what the line voltage is going to be necessarily. So when you test your line voltage, if it falls in the green range or the red, or in between, you adjust the calibrate control such that it falls on one of those lines on the calibrate section. So, actually this is pretty close to that black line as it is, but I'll tweak R23 regardless. If I knew what R23 was. R23, okay. This guy right here, the third one from the left. Tests are good because the resistor is starting to get stinky. Okay, next we're going to check the cutoff control. It's supposed to be fully counterclockwise and set the function to cutoff quality activate and hook up a VTVM. I'll use my DMM and DC volt mode. Ground to the yellow, which is a cathode, and green to your meter. And it should be negative 45, also known as it's pegging the meter. So let's say adjust R13. Let's see if I can find R13 under here. Yep, way in the back. So notice there's a neon light inside that's on. Huh, that's the lowest I can get it, negative 145, or negative 147, or what, to 189. Seems like something is not right. i go the other way. That's the most positive I can make it, is minus 73. Hmm. Huh. Well, that's not good. Double check things under there, make sure everything is correct. I could put the wrong component value in somewhere, I suppose, or something isn't hooked up right. Pretty simple circuit, though. So there's a cutoff control. It's got uh, ball bearings in there to give it a 3 1, three to one uh, reduction on it. Off adjust. Oh, they actually use a Zener diode and a transistor to regulate that. So we could have a semiconductor issue here. Huh, is R1 B plus adjust? That could be. Well, that comes later. I think that's for ex testing external voltages, maybe? 
Seems like it would affect the cutoff circuit though if R1 is right in the same circuit here. They say to adjust for the cutoff R13. Where is R13? Over here. Oh, okay, we should, we should have minus 75 volts there and minus 45. High, low. Well, maybe I'm stuck in the high position instead of the low. I'll put this in low. That's in low. Maybe that switch is dirty. Let's see. Put this back up. Well, it's definitely going a lot more negative when I go high and low. The voltage is way higher than it should be. Hmm. Now, well, looking at this circuit here, so here's power transformer. We've got a secondary here. It says 400 volts here. Uh, looks like we got a voltage doubler going in here. And uh, so it's both rectifying it and filtering it and doubling it. In fact, those are those two capacitors that I just replaced with the film. So we know those caps are good. And then we've got this. VR1. And then we've got these resistors going to ground. So what do you suppose that is? Well, I believe that is a neon light bulb. That's also doubling duty as a power indicator. Well, I just so happened to have gotten a comment recently. Um, some video I was talking about a neon light bulb and somebody was made a comment about how they can discolor and yeah this one is very blackish looking check that out and uh, he, he invited me to read up on uh, what can happen to neon light bulbs over time and I did and I gotta refresh my memory but uh, Something about the, oh, they, oh, there was that they used a slight bit of radioactivity in some of these old ones. Um, I think to make them uh, work better or start conducting at lower voltages or something like that. Anyways. And there may be an, a possible aging effect going on here that's affected the operation of this neon light bulb, but it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is not just lighting up, but also regulating this voltage to probably uh, about 90 volts and not uh, well over a hundred like it seems to be. So let's check out this neon bulb a little more closely. It's coming. Oh, <laughs> well gee, that might be a problem right there too. Uh, one end of it is going to nothing. I could have sworn I saw it lit up, and I think I did before, but maybe it's just because this had brushed against the chassis somewhere. <laughs> probably supposed to be going here. If I had a guess, it's going to that point Q on the circuit board where there is no longer a wire connected. So, let me uh, get this unplugged, take out that board again, trace out this wiring. It doesn't actually show these letters on the board and where things hook up that I can see. It was just, just with going to go on the ground, I could probably attach anywhere on the chassis. I don't know why I would have to go back to the circuit board. But, uh, yeah, let's Let's take a closer look. I hope that's just that simple. Because I don't think I have any neon light bulbs on hand. Well, I tried to find out some info on what might make a uh, neon light bulb darken, but didn't really find out much. But I did confirm that, yeah, they do often have trace amounts of radioactivity in them. And I didn't get a clear indication on what the lifespan of them might be. But I see now why I thought it was glowing. I don't know if the camera can pick that up, but that's something else I read about. Is the dark effect, which is that you can get a neon light bulb to light up even when there's no power by having an external light impinge upon it because it's causing electrons to get knocked loose from, I think, the nickel electrodes and ionize the gas inside. 
So I think before when I saw it down inside here and it looked kind of like it was illuminated, it actually wasn't. It was just a uh, stray light causing it to ionize. Alright, the other thing I find out is the uh, it does look like that O connection is indeed where it goes because it connects to this trace along here, which goes to a few things including another wire that just goes right down to the star tarp tie point on the chassis, which is, of course, ground. The only thing I found out is how this circuit actually works. It's a little different from other CRT testers I've seen. So, this theory of operation comes in handy, because they break down individual parts of the power supply. So here's the circuit we're looking at. So voltage doubler, negative voltage out, neon re regulator, and then here's the calibration adjustment, and then some fixed resistors with pickoff points. Now what I find a little odd is, I would have thought that this adjustment resistor would be on the other side. In other words, there's no um, current limiting resistor in series with that neon light. But it is coming off a voltage doubler, which inherently is limited in how much current it can put out, and they probably picked those at size of 2.2 micro or 2 microfarad capacitor, knowing that it can only supply so much current at that voltage. Right, but what I found curious is that these are fixed negative voltages that it applies to G1. It's typically when you test the CRT and you're adjusting the cutoff, this is what you're adjusting. You're using a variable negative voltage to adjust the, the, the how much current is flowing through the device. You adjust the grid voltage. No, this you set a fixed grid voltage and you adjust the anode voltage, which would be adjusting the plate voltage when you test the tube. So you used a fixed bias, but you alter the plate voltage. At least that's what it sounds like to me. So negative voltage applied to G1 and a positive applied to G2 and G3, which are connected together. And this voltage is variable from 12 to 750 volts. So you, when you adjust the cutoff, you're actually not ch changing the bias, you're changing the uh, accelerator voltage on it, essentially. Anyways, let's get that wire reconnected and see if it starts operating correctly. If not, I may have to dig up a uh, new neon light bulb. I couldn't find much out on the lifespan of these, but I had did see uh, other people indicate uh, having uh, tested equipment from about this era, and neon bulbs seem to uh, be a common failure point. All right, before I tighten everything back down, let's see if that actually made a difference. Hey, look at that. Uh, that's the that's what I was seeing lit up. There's two neon bulbs in there. Okay. Boy, you can really see the difference between them. So I bet this one is seeing a lot more load on it. Or maybe they blackened it intentionally? Because it's a panel indicator lamp. Could they have done something like that? I think it got blackened from operation. Turn off the lights so you can see those better. So, you can see one of them. You can see the illumination on the side, and the other one just kind of uh, at the ends. But hey, it is lit up. So, I'll keep using it for now while well, assuming the voltage is within spec and I'll. See if I can dig up a replacement. All right, let's try that test again. Turning it on. Needers, needles are still pegged, but uh, down to only minus 30 volts now. So let's see, calibrate that so we have minus. 45. I don't say on the, in the manual anything about the meter being pegged or not, so maybe that's normal. Minus 45. There we go. Alright. 
Turn off the toaster. Connect. Red clip lead. Good. Uh, don't seem quite right. Ground to yellow. Positive. Oh, fully clockwise. Uh, so this should increase. Yeah, okay. This is increasing. So it should max out at 400 volts DC. A little high, 417, just R1. Just right here. So nice to have. And manually, you can see why I was so lost with trying to calibrate this or use this when I first got it without the manual. And turn it off again. Now I need a 250k 1 watt resistor to continue. Alright, for this last test, I need to have a milliamp meter and my Fluke 27. Uh, I think the fuse is out on the milliamp range, so I had to switch over to my old Mastec meter. So this is going to check the restore current, or what they call activation, I guess. So we want to uh, limit that to one milliamp. So let's see how that goes. Turn this on. And we should have one milliamp and the meter should be on 10 and we're 1.5 away off of that. So I uh, just R16 to get that down, which is over here. Huh. So I can't change the current. Oh, I'm supposed to adjust the cutoff control so we get one milliamp. Ah. Okay. And adjust the meter so it's on. This trimmer. Gotta read those instructions very carefully. Oh, and for the 250k, I connected a 100k and a 150k. In series because that's not a very common value. So look at that. Exactly 1.00 milliamp. It was exactly on 10. Not worried about that too much because I probably won't be using the activate function too much. Alright, I think that is it. The last adjustment is if you want to use the external voltage measurement functions, which I don't expect I'll ever do. I have other meters I can use for measuring high voltage, so that should be it. So uh, now I'm going to get out a uh, picture tube I know is good and test it again with this. And... Um, I'll keep this one on the back burner and continue to use my Suncor CR70 until such time as I find one that the Suncor shows has a short or really bad emissions or some other problem. And then I want to pull this one out to verify. Because all the ones I have on hand right now, I know are pretty good. So if this also shows they're pretty good, I'll kind of know it's working, but I really want to also see that it verifies when there's a problem. I can't do that until I have some that I know have problems. I'm going to try testing this 12LP4. It's one you may remember. I got it with an Admiral chassis I bought off of eBay that had a damaged base. And I was able to repair it. And this was notable because it had a copper 
uh, vacuum exhaust pinch off. And hopefully, we will be seeing this tube put to use in a chassis in the not too distant future. Alright, so I know that I need socket adapter number three, which is the Duo Decal 12 pin. Basically, every black and white tube uses. Plug that into the adapter. And I got the tester turned off, and it's set for heater D, which is 6.3. Plug this guy right in. So, G1, G2 low, I'm pretty sure that's right. Switch over, get this over the read line position, black and white. Alright. Plug the tester back in. Filament is lit. The inside lid again. <laughs> I just remembered they have the instructions here. Uh, the HK leakage. Down there, which is good. If it was excessive, it would be much higher on that scale. And G1 leakage, same deal. No leakage. And go to the cutoff quality activate. New zero, which is not unusual until you start turning the cutoff adjust. Coming up fine. And I remember this tested okay before, but not fantastic. Supposed to adjust this. Oh, two divisions. <laughs> A little too far with that. So, two ticks. And then we go to quality. Okay. Kind of dropping off, stabilizing. It's in the green. It's like five and a half on that scale. I'm guessing that's in milliamps, and I think one milliamp is what you'd want to see for like a really good, strong new tube. So yeah, this is a bit worn out, which is what I had already surmised, but should be usable. As I say, a reading in the green indicates the tube has adequate emissions. Alright, so it seems to be working just fine, I think. I will call this a successful device restoration until as I say I come across one that I know has got G1 leakage or HK leakage and then we can revisit this and see if it uh, does indicate that leakage correctly. So uh, I'm just going to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this look at the functioning and calibration of an RCA WT509A color black luggage tube tester.